Well, I expect our keynote speaker may have some additional insights to provide about the Supreme Court, about the Dobbs case, and about a number of other pressing matters. So I want to take a moment to introduce him to you all, and then we can invite him to join us. Dr. Ron T. Anderson is the president of the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, D.C., and the founding editor of Public Discourse, the online journal of the Witherspoon Institute of Princeton, New Jersey. He's the author or co-author of five books, including the forthcoming Tearing Us Apart, How Abortion Harms Everything and Solves Nothing. His previously, previous books include When Harry Became Sally, Responding to the Transgender Moment. Uh, gee, if you try to go on Amazon to purchase that book, you unfortunately will not be able to because he's been canceled by Amazon. Uh, also, Truth Overruled, The Future of Marriage and Religious Freedom, What is Marriage, Man and Woman, a Defense, and Debating Religious Liberty and Discrimination. Ryan's research has actually been cited by US, two U.S. Supreme Court justices, Justice Samuel Alito and Justice Clarence Thomas, in two different Supreme Court cases. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree from Princeton University, graduating Phi Beta Kappa and Magna Cum Laude, words I never knew the meaning of at all, or, or heard in college or afterwards, until my, my children came along. Hey, Amelia and Jordan. And Kevin, my son-in-law, back in the back there. Um, he also received his doctoral degree in political philosophy from the University of Notre Dame. You may have seen Ryan on ABC, CNN, CBS, MSNBC, and all those other uh, news outlets with acronyms and initials. His work has been published by the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Oxford University Press, Cambridge University Press, the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, and on and on and on. For nine years, he was the William E. Simon Senior Research Fellow at the Heritage Foundation and has served as an adjunct professor of philosophy and political science at Christendom College and a visiting fellow at the Veritas Center at Franciscan University. He also served as an assistant editor of First Things. Ryan is also, most importantly, the husband of one wife and the parent of three children. And I consider him to be a great, great friend. So please help me welcome Ryan Anderson. Great. Um, thank you, John, for, for that very um, warm welcome. And thank you um, for everyone here tonight for coming um, to support such a great organization. Um, I think I first got to know John almost a decade ago when we were both doing work uh, related to the definition of marriage, and then we were doing work on religious liberty, and then we were doing work on gender identity, um, which is just a way to say that the past decade hasn't gone well um, <laughs> on many of these issues. I, 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 when, I, when I was listening to John do the introduction, I thought, wow, I've, I've written five books that none of my grandparents needed to read. Um, they already knew the truth about those issues without any like book learning, fancy Ivy League education, blah, blah, blah. Um, which to my mind actually points out how important uh, this organization is, how important it is that you support uh, this organization because um, these things are true and we need people bearing witness to the truth. Uh, to my mind, that's probably one of the most important uh, Christian vocations that we share, um, the, the, the vocation to be uh, bearers, bearers of uh, the truth, witnesses to the truth. And so that's what I want to talk a little bit about tonight. Um, when, when I was uh, texting with John about you know, tonight's remarks, I said, what if I speak about what to my mind are the four most, most important kind of civilizational truths um, that shouldn't be contested, but are you know, some of the most controversial issues of our culture today. Um, and yet these things are true, and they're things that we can't afford not to get right. Um, they're truths that J. Budaszewski says, they're things that we can't not know, and yet we now have an entire generation or two denying that they know them, uh, denying that they are true. And all four of these truths, um, they're knowable by reason, um, but they're so important that God reveals them to us in the very first pages of the Bible. Right? And so the four truths that were made in the image and likeness of God, that we're created male and female, that male and female are created for each other in marriage, and that all of us are created for God. 
Um, and in a variety of ways, our, our culture rejects those truths, it denies those truths. Uh, it's built upon their, uh, their falsehoods. These shouldn't be partisan issues, right? This isn't left, right, Democrat, Republican, uh, conservative, liberal. It shouldn't even be you know, Christian, non-Christian. These things are what St. Paul describes as being written on the heart, uh, things that even non-believers should know. All right, so let me start with that first one. Um, we're made in the image and likeness of God. Where is this most at risk today? Uh, we already heard John speak a little bit of this. It has to do with the 65 million unborn Americans who have been unjustly killed in the 49 and a half years since Roe v. Wade was handed down. Um, this wasn't just a Supreme Court case that the court got wrong. There are lots of cases that we could point to to say the court got that one wrong, got this one wrong, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, this was a case that committed an injustice. Right? In getting the Constitution wrong, it permitted uh, a gross injustice to take place for almost 50 years now, 65 million lives uh, lost because of Roe and then uh, subsequent cases like Casey. Um, my wife and I and you know, our three kids, uh, one of whom was in utero, my wife was uh, 38 weeks pregnant when we marched for life this year. Um, and we pray, and I think we have a firm uh, expectation that this might be the last March for Life in January. Um, if the Dobbs decision goes the way that last week's leak indicates that it's going, uh, this could be the end of the Roe and the Casey regime. Uh, we could move the annual March for, L for Life to you know, the May or the June date when the opinion gets released. That said, um, I think all of us should commit ourselves to prayer for uh, the justices' safety, um, for their resolve. Uh, it's very obvious to me that whoever leaked this was doing it to intimidate one of the justices um, to flip, you know, to join the chief justice um, in finding some compromise position in which Mississippi's law would be upheld, but Roe v. Wade would also be sustained. Right. All the news reports show that there were five justices to completely overturn Roe and Casey to finally admit that the court got this wrong, that the U.S. Constitution does not protect the right to choose lethal violence in the womb. And the leaker was doing this as a last-ditch effort to try to intimidate one of them. Or, I think even worse, um, to inspire a crazy person um, to act on the leak and to try to take out one of the justices. Um, so. The, the leak itself is just, I've, I've had, um, for I think the past nine or 10 years now, I've had a close friend, at least one close friend, clerking on the Supreme Court each and every year for the past nine or 10 years, and they won't tell me a thing. They won't tell me a thing while they're clerking. They won't tell me a thing after the clerkship is over. They take that confidentiality so seriously. Uh, some of these people, they're godparents to my kids. I'm godparents to their kids. One of them was the best man at my wedding. Lips are sealed. I know nothing about the year that they spent clerking in the court. And so for someone to leak not just um, you know, an indication of how a case might go, but to leak the entire 92-page draft opinion um, is just, you know, um, it's the first time this ever happened. It's literally unprecedented. And it just shows how abortion has corrupted everything it's touched. It's corrupted our Constitution. It's corrupted our courts, it's corrupted the rule of law, it's corrupted one of our major political parties. The Casey in Planned Parenthood v. Casey was Bob Casey Sr., the pro-life Catholic governor of Pennsylvania who was denied a speaking slot at the DNC annual convention because he was pro-life. He was denied the speaking slot uh, the year that Clinton was running for re-election. Um, today, Bob Casey Jr., uh, the senator from Pennsylvania, Bob Casey Sr.'s son, who also claims to be a pro-life Catholic, announced that he would be voting uh, tomorrow for the bill that the that Democrats are pushing to codify Roe in law, uh, to go further than Roe, to even invalidate some state uh, partial birth abortion bans. That's how radical it now is. It's corrupted everything it's touched. And the leak is just the latest um, indication of this. Uh, undermining one of our few remaining institutions that actually worked. Agree or disagree with the Supreme Court, at least the court was a functioning branch of government. Uh, and this is just um, adding more dysfunction. Uh, not so long ago, Scalia and Ginsburg could be best friends, even while disagreeing and writing dissents against each other. This is poisoning of that institution because it needs to rely on trust. 
All right, all that said about the leak, about the court itself, um, I, I want to suggest a couple of things that we could start thinking about that you could start um, working on for the day when um, Roe is finally overturned. And, you know, God willing, that'll be later this week or uh, later this month or, you know, at the end of next month. Um, and that's to say we should avoid a series of false dichotomies. Um, you will hear uh, people in the media, particularly people, uh, pro-choice advocates who are trying to trip us up um, try to present the pro-life position as it's an either or, uh, when I think uh, it necessarily needs to be a both and. So they will, they will try to make it seem like you either care about the baby or you care about the mother. Uh, and anyone who has spent any time in the pro-life movement knows that it's always been in the DNA of the pro-life movement to care both about the baby and about the mother. Uh, that women are the secondary victims of abortion. Uh, and I think moving forward that needs to continue to be our stance, not to pit mother against child or child against mother, uh, to love them both. Uh, and to see it e e even broader than just mother and baby, but there are tertiary and uh, you know, additional victims of abortion. You know, John mentioned some of the discriminatory abortions against people with disabilities, babies with Down syndromes, against racial minorities, against unborn baby girls. Uh, we've seen how abortions corrupted the practice of medicine. We've seen how it's harmed our politics, our culture, our law, et cetera, et cetera. Um, our response needs to be that we care about all of those things. We care about all of those people. Uh, we care about the way that abortion has harmed everything. A second, people will say, well, we, is it about a bad ideology or is it about material need? And we don't need to accept the either or. It, it can be both and. There is a lot of bad ideology that undergirds abortion. Anytime you hear someone say that the unborn child is a clump of cells, or anytime you hear that science doesn't know when life begins, or when you hear more honest abortion advocates say, oh sure, it's a human being, but it's not yet a human person. Those are all ideological claims at the service of a preordained conclusion. No one really believes the unborn child is a clump of cells. None of you who text ultrasound pictures to family members when you find out you're expecting, none of you who have baby books where the very first page is the ultrasound picture, are remotely persuaded by the claim that we don't know what the life in the womb is. People make those sorts of claims because they already have a preconceived conclusion in mind, which is one that's based upon a, a bad ideology of expressive individualism, right? Radical autonomy, me, me, me. I wanna be able free to do what I wanna do, unencumbered from sacrifice, unencumbered um, from duties to others, unencumbered from responsibilities. One of the things that I've learned um, since becoming a father is that some of the greatest joys in life are actually as a result of sacrifice, of burdens, of responsibilities. And so there is a deep, uh, misguided, uh, corrosive ideology that's been growing in modern American culture, this rise of um, expressive individualism. But it's not just that, there are real material factors. Um, you know, you, they're, they're, they're the elites who support abortion, they're part of a movement known as like, shout your abortion and they say that abortion's liberating. You talk to ordinary uh, women who have um, experienced abortion, they did not experience it as liberating. Right? They, they experienced it as um, the least bad option that they had in front of them. Uh, many of them were, um, if not literally coerced, they were emotionally, psychologically, culturally pressured into the abortion. Sometimes by parents, sometimes by boyfriends, by husbands, by employers. Um, a lot of women do not experience abortion as liberation, but actually uh, as a personal defeat. Uh, and so we should look seriously at both the material causes and the ideological causes, which then the, the, the next kind of false dichotomy is, do you go after the um, suppliers of abortion or do you go after um, the, the, the kind of so-called root causes? And I think here the pro-life playbook has always been both and. We want to defund Planned Parenthood right now, and as soon as Roe is overturned, we want to prohibit lethal violence in the womb. Right? We want to go after the abortionists, the people causing uh, the lethal violence, the people doing the killing. But we can also do what Texas did. Um, the media gave lots of attention to the Texas heartbeat bill right? and the ingenious way that the lawyer found a way of going around Roe v. Wade to protect unborn babies at six weeks. But simultaneously, as the state legislature passed the Texas Heartbeat Bill, they also allocated an additional $100 million 
to the Texas Alternatives to Abortion Program. That bill, the media didn't cover at all. Um, and I would be, I, I, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I, I, I would wager a guess that many of you didn't know that the Texas Alternatives to Abortion Program existed or that they had just allocated an additional $100 million to that program. Um, just, I think it's now three weeks ago, Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida signed into law a fatherhood initiative, which provided funding to try to help men um, uh, assume their responsibilities and fulfill their duties as fathers. All of those things should be on the table uh, for the pro-life movement after Roe is gone. They should be on the table now, as Texas and Florida has already shown us. We can both prohibit abortion and provide concrete, tangible support to women facing unplanned pregnancies. And then the last false dichotomy, is it about the law or is it about the culture? And the answer is both and. It's both about changing the law and about changing the culture. And these things are symbiotic. Uh, they're going to mutually reinforce each other or they're going to mutually uh, destroy each other. Um, so think about everything I've already said about uh, the abortion uh, program moving forward. We need all of the pregnancy resource centers. We need groups like NC Family Policy Council bearing witness to the truth. We need Project Rachel. We need um, various programs in the culture um, assisting mothers experiencing unplanned pregnancies, assisting women who have had abortions and are suffering from the consequences. We need people uh, working to change hearts and minds. We also need people working to change laws. Right? We can't do it with one or the other. It needs to be both and. Uh, and the laws need to be holistic, uh, both about protecting unborn babies uh, from abortion and about providing assistance uh, to mothers. Okay, so that's for now um, all I want to say about being made in the image and likeness of God. There's a lot more that we could say, but um, John has me on a very tight leash. Um, <laughs> to make sure you could all get home uh, uh, on time tonight. Second thing, um, this is something, you know, I've spoken at these dinners, um, I think twice before in different cities, and I don't think I ever uttered the phrase gender identity at either of those dinners, because it was, it was at least five years ago um, that I was here. And as soon as LGBT activist groups redefined marriage, they pivoted from the LGB part of the acronym to the T part of the acronym. Um, and this is something that uh, is touching every segment of America. Um, this is not something that you can kind of opt out of, that you could hide from. Uh, it's in all of our schools, all of our churches, uh, all of our communities. Uh, and what I mean by that is not so much that you know, it's coming from the pulpit, but there are families experiencing this um, everywhere. And their stories are just utterly tragic, utterly um, heartbreaking. And I want to mention a couple of reasons why we should be concerned about this. Uh, and the first thing I'll say is I live in Loudoun County, Virginia. And I can tell from you know, some of the uh, vocal reaction that you know what I'm getting at here. Um, your state was prophetic on this with HB2. You knew what would happen if you allowed people to use um, uh, uh, the single sex facility of their choice that aligned with their gender identity. So where I live in Loudoun County, Virginia, two different uh, middle school girls sexually assaulted in the school girls' bathroom by the same boy identifying as a girl. And at the school board meeting, um, the only person who, who at, the, at that time uh, ended up being arrested was the father of one of those girls who went to the school board meeting to publicly say what happened. Um, because of the change of the election, my understanding now is that um, with a new governor in Richmond, a new attorney general, there's actually going to be a state investigation of the Loudoun County School Board and of the school superintendent for what went on. <laughs> but those, uh, those two uh, Loudoun County girls um, are victims of trans ideology. So too are all of the University of Pennsylvania uh, swim team members who were forced this past year to share a locker room with a fully intact boy identifying as a girl, forced to shower in the same shower facility, change into their swimsuits in the same locker room. So too were all of the female athletes who didn't medal, who didn't get their chance at the podium because of that athlete. Um, they were victims. Their equality, their fairness in competition was violated. And we could give other examples. The UPenn one's the most recent. So too were the female inmates uh, who have been sexually assaulted by men who transferred 
to female jails because they identify as female. And you don't need to be an Ivy League educated person to have predicted what the outcome was likely to be if you have sex offenders now claiming to be female and asking to be transferred to female jails. So a, a variety of ways in which you could see consequences. Consequences for medical doctors who don't want to perform these procedures. There are two Catholic hospitals currently being sued by the ACLU because they declined to perform sex reassignment procedures. Um, there's a medical doctor, former chair of pediatric psych psychiatry, who spoke at a panel I organized at the Heritage Foundation four years ago, and then the next year he was terminated from his job. He was the division chair. He had great ratings. He was in his 60s. They weren't doing this about him, they were doing it to set an example to his students. So that future students, uh, psychiatry, doctors, would be afraid to speak out, and we most need people to speak out. So a variety of consequences, but the biggest consequence are to the people themselves who identify as transgender. People struggling with their gender identity, people who don't quite feel comfortable in their own bodies, or people who get caught up in internet chat rooms and social media memes and the social contagion aspect to this. Um, this is an entire abuse of medicine. It's an unethical form uh, of the practice of medicine. When we now have children um, being placed on puberty blocking drugs, right? seven, eight, nine year olds, because they quote, identify as the opposite sex being blocked from ever going through their natural biological development. We have teenage girls going on testosterone. We have teenage boys going on estrogen. All of our tax dollars have paid for two double mastectomies on 13-year-old girls as part of an NIH-funded study on to, um, uh, uh, treatments for gender dysphoria. Those are victims of this terrible ideology. Their families are victims. It's been just shattering of families where, where this happens. Um, and again, it's, it's everywhere. It's not as if it's just, oh, that only happens to bad parents, or oh, that only happens to people who are you know, secular progressives. It's permeated everywhere in our culture, and we need people willing um, to stand up and to tell the truth. OK, um, that's all I'll say for, again, right now. I, I could, when I get worked up, I could go for a while, because I just think it's, I, I, I think it's evil. Uh, there's no other way of describing uh, what's taking place, and it's why it's important that there are groups willing uh, to advocate for the truth at state houses, willing to advocate in the public square for these things, because what the left does is they try to intimidate people into silence, right? They harass Supreme Court justices at their homes. They try to get um, um, you know, professors at medical schools fired from their jobs so that people learn the lesson to just keep their mouth shut. And this is why it's important uh, what John's doing and what all of you are doing uh, here tonight. The third truth, um, not only are we created male and female, but male and female are created for each other in marriage. Uh, this hasn't changed just because the Supreme Court got another case wrong. Right? They got Windsor wrong, they got Obergefell wrong. That doesn't actually change the truth about marriage, nor does it change the importance of marriage. Right? The reason that any of us who are active in the um, so-called gay marriage debate were involved at all is because we cared about the larger marriage debate. Right? And the emphasis wasn't on the gay part, it was on the marriage part. Marriage is about uniting men and women as husbands and wives to then be mothers and fathers to the children that that union creates. Uh, it's based not on um, a, 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 an ecclesial law, but on a natural law. And what I mean by that is that we don't want the government in the baptism business. Right? Do any of you want Nancy Pelosi or Joe Biden regulating baptism for you? They're members of my church, and I don't want them involved in <laughs> baptism. Um, but we do have the state in the marriage business, because marriage is both a natural institution and a supernatural institution. Right? Uh, marriage plays both a civic fun function in producing the next generation of citizens and then raising the next generation of citizens to adulthood, and it plays a sacred function. And Jesus elevates marriage. Um, we can have Protestant Catholic debates about sacramental theology or covenantal theology, but he takes a natural institution that's there at creation and he elevates it into the supernatural domain. And so marriage needs to do dual service. When marriages fail to form in the first place, when marriages fall apart prematurely, that's where you get the social scientists just give you reams of evidence about the poor outcomes. 
poor outcomes for the adults, men who never get married, or uh, um, particularly women after divorce. It's not good for adults uh, in those situations. Children who are conceived either outside of marriage or children um, uh, where their parents uh, separate without good reason. This is where you see lower rates of graduation, higher rates of poverty, lower rates of employment, higher rates of incarceration, et cetera, et cetera. Marriage is like the original um, Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. It's the best way of producing that next generation. The legal redefinition of marriage doesn't do anything to uh, advance marriage. It only makes it harder to say um, something that I heard Pope Francis say about seven years ago. I was in the room where he said this, a child has a right to a mother and a father. Right? And today, how many either of our religious leaders, our civic leaders, or just kind of you know, ordinary Americans are willing to assert that, that a child deserves, in Pope Francis' language, that a child has a right to a mother and a father. Right, that's all I'm going to say about that for the sake of time. I could say more. Actually, I will say one last thing. <laughs> all of which is to say that even though temporarily we've experienced a setback with Obergefell, with the Supreme Court's ruling on marriage, that doesn't mean that we should stop advocating either for the truth about what marriage is, or, I mean, simultaneously, just trying to promote family and marriage. The law could be wrong about marriage, while churches, civic organizations, various um, uh, kind of community groups are trying to encourage people to get married, to say, stay married, to give people the skill sets that they need uh, to avoid divorce. Um, one of the things that um, researchers, friends of mine at uh, BYU University uh, have been exploring is just, for many people, just a simple conflict resolution uh, training program, like a four-week course on the weekends, gives them a toolkit that they need to be able to talk to their spouse about conflicts that they're experiencing in marriage, rather than prematurely giving up on their marriage. Right? Civic things like that that we could be doing, even under an Obergefell regime. Ways of combating the hookup culture, ways of combating cohabitation, all of these things are still possible, even while the law uh, is wrong, and we should be doing all of them. All right, last truth that I want to mention. So we're made in the image and likeness of God. We're created male and female. Male and female are created for each other in marriage. The fourth truth, all of us are created for God. Right? It's the corollary of being made in the image and likeness of God. We're all uh, made for God. He's made us uh, for himself. Our hearts are restless until they rest in him, in Augustine's famous phrase um, uh, from the Confessions. And this means... Um, that it's at our um, own folly to try to think that we can organize our public life as if God doesn't exist. Right? And so the two things that I want to hit at here, one is going to be the role of religion in the public square, and then the second, the importance, the centrality of religious liberty. Uh, and the th first thing to say, the role of religion in the public square, none of the founders thought that what they were doing was creating what uh, Father Richard John Newhouse referred to as the naked public square. None of them thought the First Amendment to our Constitution, which protects the free exercise of religion and prohibits Congress from establishing religion, none of them thought that meant that they were separating um, religion from politics or morality from law. What they were doing is they were prohibiting the federal government from establishing a church, and that was it. It was an institutional separation. The institution of the church and the institution of the state were two different institutions. But of course, religious believers need to be active in the public square. Religious believers need to be advocating for justice, advocating for the least among, ours, uh, among us. The founders knew that actually a, this, this, this experiment in democratic self-government wouldn't be possible unless the people themselves were self-governed and unless uh, they, they were based upon uh, a sound understanding of morality and religion, right? that our constitution was made uh, only was our constitution was intended only for a moral and religious people. It was unsuitable to any other. Right? And yet, what we've tried to do now for two generations is to conduct our public life as if God doesn't exist, as if religion and morality have nothing to say about law and justice. And look where it's got us. Right? And so, I think one thing that's going to be important is for religious believers to be able to speak into these debates 
and to do it in a way that's not um, confrontational, off-putting, derogatory, to do it in a winsome, charitable, but forceful and persuasive way. And I think those are a set of skills that John has. It's as you could see uh, in the videos, the testimonies from the various state lawmakers. We need someone bringing that uh, faith perspective to bear in our laws. We need it uh, a moral foundation to our laws. Second thing to say, we cannot uh, allow the government to coerce people when it comes to their conscientious beliefs. We can't allow the government to force Roman Catholic nuns to pay for abortion-causing contraceptives. We can't allow the government to force evangelical bakers to bake cakes celebrating same-sex weddings. We can't allow the government to force two Catholic hospitals into performing sex reassignment procedures. We can't allow the government to force Christian adoption agencies into placing children with two moms or two dads rather than both a mother and a father. And all of the examples I just gave you are from you know, within the past five years, Supreme Court cases. Right? All of those issues, I didn't make any of them up. They're not kind of scaremongering. They're not, you know, let's just take the worst case scenario. All of those are kind of real live cases that we need to be engaged in. Um, and one reason why is because the duties that we have to God are the most important duties that we have, period. Right? This is something that both George Washington and James Madison, if you read some of their writings on religious liberty, they fully understood that because we have certain duties to the creator, that then creates rights amongst men. And the right to religious liberty, the right to the free exercise of religion, not just the freedom of worship, uh, one of the most annoying things during um, uh, the Obama presidency was when Secretary of State John Kerry and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton kept redefining free exercise of religion as freedom of worship. Because what that implies is that, oh sure, the little sisters of the poor, they're free to do what they wanna do when they're in their chapel. Right? They can go to mass, they can pray a rosary, like whatever. But as soon as they step outside of the four walls of their chapel and they start taking care of the elderly, the sick, the dying, then they have to play by the government's rules. Right? What the founders intended with the free exercise of religion was something not just you know, one hour Sunday morning, maybe an hour Wednesday night for a Bible study, a men's group. No, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You should be free to live according to your deepest convictions about God, provided they're peaceful, right? provided they don't harm other people, provided they don't undermine justice or the common good. Right? Obviously, there are going to be limits to all of our liberty. There'll be limits to religious liberty. Right? That's why the Aztecs couldn't say, I have a religious liberty right to engage in human sacrifice. But the little sisters of the poor, the adoption agencies, the baker, the florists, photographer, the medical doctors, they weren't harming anyone. Right? All they wanted to do was to be free to do good to people in need. Right? And if you think about everything I've said tonight in terms of the abortion debate, in terms of the marriage debate, in terms of the gender identity debate, it's going to be vitally important that faith-based institutions maintain the freedom to exercise in accordance with the truth on those issues. It'll be vitally important that uh, Christian adoption agencies can keep the doors open to assist children in need, to assist young women who want to place a child with a faith-based agency. Right? So imagine what your experience is like at the DMV. Every couple of years, you have to go to renew your driver's license. And then imagine what it would be like working with like the government DMV version of an adoption agency. Right? There might be a reason why the faith-based agencies do a better job at this, because adopting a child isn't just um, you know, a perfunctory paperwork issue. It's something that touches all aspects of the human person. There's an, a, a, an economic component, but there's also a deep emotional, spiritual component. Faith-based agencies can minister to the entire person, to the entire family, can minister both to the mother placing the child for abortion, uh, for adoption, sorry, and the family seeking to adopt that child. We want them to maintain the freedom to do so. We need them to be able to do so. We need um, uh, faith-based hospitals to practice good medicine for people with gender dysphoria. Right? We need there to be places where families can turn to uh, right now, I mean, this is, this, is, this is something that we need a generation of Christian medical school students to go and specialize in, in, in good medicine for people with gender dysphoria. There's a very small list 
of physicians um, who practice medicine correctly, and it's a confidential list because they're afraid of being targeted and losing their jobs because they're, they're, they don't know what their religious liberty rights will look like. Right? We need to protect the religious liberty on these rights, whether it's for the adoption agencies, whether it's for the medical professionals, and I think even most important, for the schools. Right? Why do so many families sacrifice to pay tuition to send their kids to a church school rather than going to the government-run school for free? Because so many jurisdictions, you can't trust the public schools. Right? Um, I live in one of those jurisdictions, unfortunately. My wife and I have the luxury, we're gonna homeschool our kids. Many families don't have that luxury. We live less than a mile away from a trailer park. And right across the street from that trailer park is the public school, the Luckett's Elementary School. Those families are trapped in that school. That's their only option, right? And so um, simultaneously, we, we're gonna have to work for school reform uh, to give them better options and work for religious liberty so that the people who want to opt out in the meantime have the freedom to do so. Parental rights, one of the things that I heard John mention um, that uh, NC Family Policy is working on. All of these things need to go together because we're going to need to protect the freedom for people who momentarily might be in the minority. Right? Momentarily on some of these issues, uh, we might be in the minority. We need the freedom to continue living out the truth, bearing witness to the truth, evangelizing, converting, winning hearts and minds so that more people come to believe the truth, come to know the truth, because ultimately the truth is a person. And so let me wrap up there. I'll just say, um, I'm a, um, you know, I, I, I now run, uh, which is something I never thought I would have to say. I now run a think tank, which means I have to deal with all sorts of administrative um, uh, and financial uh, issues. But my main vocation historically was I was a scholar, right? I like reading, I like writing. Um, my kind of um, bread and butter is, you know, spending eight hours a day alone in a room with books. Uh, and I enjoy that. Um, and as important as that is, and, and, and here I, I, I'll quote someone who's even better at that than I am, uh, probably, you know, one of the, the greatest intellectuals of, um, of all, all of our lifetimes, because he's still, uh, thank God, living. Um, and that's Pope Emeritus uh, Benedict. Um, and you know, before he became Pope Benedict, he was uh, a Cardinal Ratzinger. He was one of the leading European intellectuals. And he debated all the leading secularist philosophers and all the like, anti-God theologians, et cetera, et cetera, in Europe. And one of his quotes um, that's always kind of stuck with me is where he said, it's not the arguments of the philosophers and the theologians that win converts. It's the beauty of the artists and the holiness of the saints. And what he meant by that is like, as important as it is that people like John and me make good arguments, it's even more important that all of us live out the truth with beauty and holiness. That our best witness long term, intergenerationally, our best witness to our own families, to our neighbors, to our coworkers, isn't going to be the email that we send them, the tweet that we send them, might not even be the book that you give them, it's going to be your own life the beauty of your life, the family life that you build, uh, the holiness that's evident in your life. Uh, and on that, um, no matter what happens later this month or next month at the Supreme Court, no matter what happens in the law or the culture, all of us uh, cooperating with God's grace uh, have it within our power um, to, to be those witnesses, beautiful, holy witnesses to the truth. Thank you. <laughs>